Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice! Exult! Which means leap for joy. <laughs> Be joyful! That's the theme of this third Sunday of Advent. You may have noticed that our Verger's assistant lit the pink or rose-colored candle on the Advent wreath today. This is the joy candle. That rose color symbolizes joy. Traditionally, many churches even use rose-colored vestments on this day to emphasize the theme of joy. As we said in lighting the Advent candle, we are waiting in joy for the coming of the Lord, and we take joy in Him. But the readings we heard seem to suggest there's more going on here than just rejoice because the birth of the Lord is near. For example, to drive home this theme of rejoicing and joyfulness, our Gospel reading opens with John the Baptist saying to the crowds, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Repent! Oops. Seems to be a little bit of a disconnect here. Looking at the Gospel lesson, we don't see, at least on the surface, much about rejoicing and being joyful. Maybe John misheard the word that came from God. It's supposed to be rejoice, not repent. Now Paul clearly got it right. In our reading from Philippians, Paul tells us to rejoice, not just once, but twice. So what's going on here? Is the Gospel reading just off track for this Joy Sunday? Well, let's start by looking at the Gospel lesson from Luke to see if we can put this together. And I invite you to pull out your leaflet and follow along if you'd like to see the text. Clearly, John is calling the crowds to repent, to change their ways and to receive a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He tells them they cannot just rely on God's covenant with Abraham. They do not have an automatic salvation just because they are his descendants. Then comes the tough message. Judgment time is coming. Every tree that does not bear good fruit that is, fruit worthy of repentance will be cut down and thrown into the fire. <coughs> we must not, we cannot, ignore or pass by the meaning here. There will be a judgment day. The creed says Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. And for those who do not bear good fruit, the outcome will not be pleasant. Well, it seems that John now has the attention of the crowds, and hopefully our attention too. They ask him, what then should we do? John's answer is interesting and surprising. Rather than telling them to put on sackcloth and ashes, or to make sacrifices, or to just follow God's law, follow the commandments. He gives them very specific, concrete examples of what it looks like to bear fruits worthy of repentance. This is a subtle sign that something new is afoot here. For the crowds, he says, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Now this is truly amazing. John the Baptist just gave the best plug ever for our coat and warm clothing donation ministry here at St. Matthew's Cathedral. You may have noticed that in the bulletin for several weeks, we've had a notice in there that we're collecting coats and warm clothing 
for the benefit of our neighbors who are in need, many of whom are homeless, and with the, warm, the cold weather coming on, uh, that is of great benefit to them. A big thank you to the many people who have already donated, donated coats and clothing. We will continue to receive donations until the warm weather in the spring. From John's lips to your ears. John also says those who have food must do likewise, share it with those in need. Now how about that? On the second page of your bulletin today, we have an item in here about our food pantry this Thursday morning. We're having a special holiday meal for our patrons. In addition to the food pantry, there'll be a special meal, and we'll hand out all those holiday hams we've collected. And thank you, thank you for the many donations that all of you have made. And thank you, John the Baptist, for your words and support of these ministries. Now, we need to be clear on one point. Is John saying repent, share your coat, share your food, and that's your ticket into heaven? No, of course not. Good works alone don't buy us salvation. Our actions in serving others are the fruits, the outward signs of our relationship with Jesus Christ, our love for him, and our life in him. I'll say more about that in a moment. Looking back now to Luke's text, the tax collectors and the soldiers come to John and ask, what then should we do? To the tax collectors he says, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. To the soldiers he says, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. Notice that all of John's examples of the good fruits, the fruits worthy of repentance, are specific examples of a central teaching in Judaism that is carried through strongly in Jesus' teachings. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is embodied very clearly in Jesus' teaching in chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel. That is where Jesus teaches us that we are to give food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, welcome to the stranger, clothing to the naked, fellowship to the prisoner. And when we have done these things for those he calls the least of these who are members of my family, we have done it to him. I urge you to take a bit of time today or tomorrow and as an Advent devotion, Pull out your Bible and read Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. It's Matthew chapter 12, 25, verses 31 through 46. I think you will see the direct connection between the message of John the Baptist here in Luke and Jesus' teaching there in Matthew. It is virtually the same message. Next in our text from Luke, he tells us that the people began to wonder if John might be the Messiah. John tells them plainly, I am not the Messiah, but he is coming. He is more powerful than I. I baptize you with water, but when he baptizes you, you will receive the Holy Spirit, which can purify you with a refining fire. And then back to the message of judgment. The Messiah has his winnowing fork in his hand. He will gather in the wheat, the good fruit, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. To sum it up, John's message to the crowds and to us is this. If we live with our central concern and our central focus, being solely on our own well-being, our own happiness, our own pleasure, and accumulating the material possessions we deem necessary to satisfy those, we need to change direction in our life. 
That way of living does not bear fruits worthy of repentance. That is not a life that reflects the core value of God's law and teaching to love your neighbor as yourself. John speaks of the new baptism that Jesus will give us, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That way of living, where we're focused solely on our own needs and desires, it's a life in which we fail to live into our baptism in the Holy Spirit. Each of us is called by our baptism to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourself. We are called by our baptism to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to live so that his teachings can be seen in the way we live, and to adopt and live into his values to the greatest extent that we can. Now, so far, we haven't said much about rejoicing and being joyful on this Joy Sunday. Let's look at Paul's letter to the Philippians to see what he has to say. Right off the bat, Paul exhorts us to rejoice in the Lord always, and he even says it again for emphasis. Then he says something that seems to be completely unrelated. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Gentleness. What does Paul mean by that? Let your gentleness be known to everyone. This is a bit puzzling, but the commentators provide us some help on this. <clears throat> the, original, the original Greek word that is translated here as gentleness has a meaning that is really more positive, denoting generosity toward others, which is a characteristic, of course, of Christ himself. The Revised English Bible renders the sentence, that same sentence, as this. Be known to everyone for your consideration of others. And the Common English Bible translates it this way. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. Gentleness in our treatment of others. Generosity toward others. Consideration of others, sharing and serving the needs of others. All of this is encompassed within Paul's meaning, which we see translated as gentleness. This is the same attitude and way of living that John the Baptist calls the fruits worthy of repentance and reflects the attitude and values of Jesus himself. Paul goes on, the Lord is near. This has special meaning in Advent, and we see this theme throughout today's readings. It speaks not only of the nearness of the Lord's coming in Advent, but the reality of the Lord's spiritual presence here among us, his real sacramental presence in the Eucharist, and the reality of his presence with each of us every day. Then Paul instructs us to lift our prayers to God, to pray to God with thanksgiving. And finally he says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This peace Paul speaks of is not just calmness, or an absence of conflict. Rather, it is a sense of total and complete well-being, not only when all is well in our lives, but even when the hard times come, and even in the midst of the darkness, violence, and human suffering we so often see in the world around us. The source of this peace is our relationship with God in and through Jesus Christ. It comes from God himself to those who are living in Christ Jesus, those whose lives reflect his teachings and bear fruits worthy of repentance. 
Together, what John the Baptist and Paul are telling us is this. We must live into our baptism with Christ. We must live into real discipleship, adopting his teachings, his values, his attitudes, his concern and care for those in need. The way we conduct ourselves and what we do in our lives will then reflect his teaching and values. The more and more we grow into this way of living, of living in Christ Jesus, the more we will live in the peace of God that Paul describes. In the 16th chapter of his Gospel, the Apostle John recounts what Jesus told the Twelve on the night that he was arrested. He said this, I came from the Father into the world, and I am leaving the world and going to the Father. And he told them that in and through him, they too were in relationship with the Father. And then he told them this, I have said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face trouble, but take courage, I have conquered the world. Notice that Jesus says, I have conquered the world, not I will conquer the world. The peace of God that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The, that sure, unshakable, immovable sense of complete well-being based on the sure knowledge because we live in Him that He has come, He is here, He will come again, and His kingdom will have no end. And in Him, we will have a place in His eternal kingdom. He has conquered the world. Rejoice! Exult! Our Lord and Savior now draws near.